up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. Today, actually, this is not a, a Nerd Gen Report. This is a Nerd Gen Review. We're going to be reviewing Black Widow. We've seen it. Brian saw it yesterday. He did a good job of not letting me know nothing of what he felt about it. I was, I, oh, I was this close to paying $30 to see it. Just so that I can just get it, you know, just to watch it. But I said, let me wait, let me wait, let me wait. I stayed away as much as I could from social media as well. And I saw it today. Now, it's it, it's here amidst a bunch of delays. Most people have seen it. And Brian, as soon as I told you I saw it, tell me what you thought. You told me that this was one of the worst MCU films we've gotten thus far. It was sloppy. These are the adjectives. Sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said you wanted to leave. I wanted to leave in Batman versus Superman. I didn't get a sense that feeling watching Black Widow. Um, I'm interested very much so to hear your thoughts on why you think this movie was uh, one of the worst. But before we get into that, I'd also like to say that, you know, I put myself out there and saying that this would be one of the, you know, this would be on par with The Winter Soldier. It wasn't that. It wasn't top shelf. It wasn't when the soldier was an end game. It wasn't infinity war. It wasn't the first iron man. Um, it maybe wasn't even black Panther, but I enjoyed this film. Let's get that out of the way. I didn't think it was horrible. Um, but I'm very interested in, in hearing what you have to say, Brian, tell me why this was one of the worst MCU films and why you wanted to leave. The theaters. Yeah, look, I mean, Marvel doesn't do horrible, right? So when we say one of the worst MCU films, like we're talking about Thor The Dark World, um, maybe Iron Man 2. You know, and 3. That, and 3. Um, you know, Age of Ultron, maybe in the ballpark, depending how you feel about that one. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the Captain Marvel, obviously. I think that those are kind of the, maybe the, a lot of people have some mix of that five near the bottom. So I'm saying in no uncertain terms, I think this movie belongs in that tier. I think it's forgettable. I think if I had someone who was not a serious fan of the MCU and who asked me, should I go to the theater? To see? I haven't been to a movie in 18 months. Should I break my, break my quarantine and go to the theater to see this? I would say no. I would say wait for it to come on Disney Plus for free, you're not missing it that much. Uh, and you don't need to see this, for better or for worse, you don't really need to see this to connect to anything else, uh, which I think is notable. Yeah. So my headline on this movie as to why I felt this way, and I'll be honest, Pablo, I felt better about it. Like in the first half of the movie, I felt like I was enjoying just being back in a Marvel movie. I was a little bit caught up in that. And it took a while to sink in where I was like, I don't feel right. Like something doesn't feel like it usually feels when I'm watching these movies. And then it was like the next day, I kind of like parsed it, broke it down. And I was like, you know what, here's why. And then I started taking my notes and, and I've got, we'll go through a bunch of topics and I'll throw them back to you to, you know, rebut. Cause I know you liked it better than I did. But if I had a headline, I would say the first half of this movie felt like a second rate Jason Bourne movie. The second half of this movie felt like a second rate James Bond movie, and they sprinkled in a Winter Soldier ripoff along the way. That's my one sentence. And like to me, that's not a good movie. And I think it's disappointing given that this character has had so long to germinate and be examined by the parliament, by the folks at Marvel. They knew everything that was good about this character, everything that clicked with audiences, everything that didn't. So for them to come with this at the end of all that, I think is a massive disappointment. 
And so that to me in a nutshell, not to say there's no bad, there's no, there's definitely some good elements. We'll talk about it, but in a nutshell, that's why I walk away from this underwhelmed. And I feel like I just have no real need to rewatch this. Do you sort, would you compare it to uh, Solo's outing in Star Wars? No, you know what actually more came to mind for a couple of reasons? I compare it to X-Men Origins Wolverine. It actually felt like 20th Century Fox Yikes. made this movie from inside Disney, not the other way around. In the, and the reason why I say that is because Wolverine and Hugh Jackman Wolverine was a character that had already been established in front of audiences. That we knew what made that character work or not work. And then they did this movie and made some baffling choices to where you're like, you kind of have a layup in the character. How could you come up with this as your output? It's not as bad as that. I don't. I, I mean the analog of just what I said. Mm -hmm. And there's one other analog, which is on the villains. They made a very similar decision in this movie as that movie made, which is unex inexplicable to me. Um, but it, it just had that feel of, you know, I didn't have the expectations you did. But I didn't think there was a universe where I would walk out of this being like, it's a toss up between this and Captain Marvel. And like, that's kind of how I feel. And it makes me almost wonder, like Marvel's still struggling to write that, you know, consummate female centric movie. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I, what did you, uh, what, what made, what, guess, what did you like most about it then? Cause you, you obviously liked it more, so. I liked the relationship. I mean, that, I like very detailed things. I liked the relationship between um, Florence Pugh and and Scarlett Johansson. I like the uh, is it David Harbor? David Harbor, yeah, yeah. I thought he was great. I think I thought that family aspect was great. I mean, it was mostly them. Taskmaster was forgettable. I, although I thought when he in each scene that he was in. Um, other than the last ones, I didn't really care too much for that little twist at the end. By the way, this may be a spoiler episode. If you haven't seen it, don't watch. Oh this. yeah, we're definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I thought he certainly had a presence every time he showed up on screen. Um, before that little thing that 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 happened at the end, which was kind of whatever, but. It wasn't like, oh my God, this is what they came up with. It was, you know, I mean, if you think about Taskmaster in the in, in the in the in the comic books, they really changed the origin of that character. Um, but for me, the way I felt about this movie was they sort of paid an homage to Scarlett Johansson and her character, and sort of given her that ending, so to speak, for her character. And also setting up the future for the Black Widow. Uh, I think they executed that part pretty well. I think for the most part, I if you didn't care too much about her, her backstory, Black Widow's black backstory, or Scarlett Johansson's Natasha Romanoff's character backstory, if you didn't care too much about it, you probably weren't wasn't gonna care too much about this uh movie anyway. Um Having said that, I, I think it was a good film. I liked the film. Am I going to see it again? Possibly. I'm not going to pay $30 for it. But I'll see it again if it comes on. I don't think it was that bad that, oh, I got to skip over it. No, I don't, I don't think it was that bad. Uh, caliber of a movie i definitely think i would catch it again if it if it was on disney plus for free i'll definitely watch it again but there were a lot of good fun moments in that film against florence Pugh and david harbour without them this movie really flops okay uh, well you you're hitting on one florence Pugh almost single-handedly saved this movie. yeah yeah we'll yeah. talk about more about her i want to talk more about her but she's brilliant yes um Somebody on YouTube has already cut up every one of her scenes and, and, the, and the montage is like two minutes and 15 seconds long out of a two and a half hour movie. So I'm just, if you want to watch the best parts of the movie, just watch that. <laughs> two minutes and 15 seconds. Okay, so she's awesome. I agree, yeah. with you on, I agree with you on Harvard. Here's my question for you though. 
as we know, when these movies ultimately come to cable, they're always on TNT, TV. They're on these channels all the time. Oh, yeah. What's the part of this movie where if you're flipping channels, you're going to stop and say, I have to see these 10 minutes? I think the, the I, I understand what you're asking. Um, right, because like in Winter Soldier, you can drop me in any yeah, part yeah, of yeah. that movie and we are within 10 minutes of something where it's like, I got to stick around to see this for the 110th time. I can watch the Winter Soldier with the last 10 minutes, middle, I can watch it at any point. Anywhere. That's my, so that's okay. the gold standard, right? Okay, yes. And Infinity War is pretty darn close to that. Yeah. At so, Endgame, and in the beginning of Endgame, I, I was watching Endgame before we just got, we got on the show. I was watching. <laughs> so um, that's what I said. What is that ten minutes here? That I I don't I can think of a, a very uh, quick scenes, but I can't think of like a set piece or a sequence where I'm like I'm gonna want to watch that over and over and over again. I think um, a lot of the scenes with Flores Peter when they're together and talking and. and and then with the family, David Harbour is. There's a few. There's a couple of. There's probably like thirty minutes of movie there that I'd watch uh, again and again. Okay. Um, but the whole thing, I don't possibly now. I'll probably watch the whole thing again um, whenever it comes on for free. But after that, there isn't much that'll keep my attention because I've seen all I need to see of that film. Again, you're not possibly gonna get. The Taskmaster, who knows? Um, but to me, the Taskmaster served his purpose, although it wasn't. He served his purpose in this in this sense. I, Taskmaster is not Doom. Taskmaster is not uh, Kang, Thanos. These or oh, 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 what's this guy's name? Um, Osborn. He's not these big, he's one of those, he's like a chameleon. He's like chameleon in Spider-Man. He's one of those dudes that does stuff, right? Yeah. And he's good at what he does. And he can be, I think that Taskmaster and what he was doing when, in the fighting scenes, he was dope. But for a character that- a, I think it's ahead. such a missed opportunity. I, I, it's on my list. Um, you know, Marvel, as we know, suffers from the villain problem. I think this character was wasted. Um, and this is, I made the comment about X-Men Origins Wolverine. Mm -hmm. Taskmaster in this movie to me is what they did to Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool in that movie. Taskmaster wow. in the comics. Well, Taskmaster in the comics is effectively Deadpool. He's a wisecracking, arrogant, like cynical okay. character. I'll give you that. Then his calling card is this ability to mimic high level, precise fighting skills. And so to me, one of the things that excited me about the choice in this movie, not knowing the choices they made, was we have said on so many occasions that Scarlett Johansson, like pound for pound, scene for scene, is the, pretty much had the best choreographed fighting in the MCU. So I'm like, all right, you're going to take the person who's given us the, some of the coolest like sort of martial arts-esque, you know, action. And you're going to pit her against a character who can literally do anything any other Avenger can do. Yeah. We never got that. You, I, I'll give you that we one. We never got that in this movie. And one. now the way they left the Taskmaster, there's no way to get that. Yeah. So when we get to the end, I actually have like, as always, try not to be too much of a critic unless I have a potential solution. I'll throw an alternative to this movie, a version of this movie at you. But it just made me feel like this was a, a character that I agree with you is not strong enough to be an anchor on its own of like multiple films as a villain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for this film uh, opposite this protagonist, I think it could have been a really climactic physical showdown and we got robbed of it and yeah i feel cheated that we didn't see it i i hear what you're saying i, I if okay so you you you're you put it up you're being put up against someone that can mimic your fight and then not to be able to figure that fight sequence out where either florence Pugh herself or natasha romanoff is able to beat the taskmaster at fighting 
how was that not a major component of the no, drama no, 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 no. and the build of this movie? You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That was a missed opportunity on their end. Because even in the comics, went, they, yeah. they, they, they figured that stuff out, which was one of the probably one of the things that you talk about the most when you talk about Taskmaster and how you, they were able to figure out how to beat him. But if that's why also yeah. to me, like Scarlett Johansson as this super spy, we've also seen throughout the MCU, she's she beats people with her mind. Like she's able to trick Loki in a negotiation to giving up his plan in Avengers. This was the perfect setup of like, you have to match wits and strength against someone who is superior at the skills that you have. And like to not even explore that. And yeah. not only that, like with Taskmaster, the kind of the most dramatic action deployments we would see were pretty much Winter Soldier ripoffs, yeah. right down to when Taskmaster used the Hawkeye arrow and blew the truck from yeah. underneath. That's exactly what Winter Soldier did mm, to Sam yeah. Jackson. It's yeah. the same effect. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, I can't believe that got past the parliament as like, this is new and cool, because it wasn't. Yeah, the parliament failed at that um, exposition and the opportunities to really be on that top shelf um, MCU film category. Um, Nonetheless, nonetheless, I enjoyed the film. Um, I didn't feel myself with that. There were, I'll say this. I didn't have that same feeling that I had for, you know, like the Winter Soldier and, and Infinity War and Endgame. I was just there, you know, just watching the film and there were, there were some good moments. The dialogue wasn't bad. Uh, the humor wasn't bad, um, but I hear where you're coming from in that the missed opportunities were there and because they didn't deliver it, I don't know if it makes it uh, uh, one of the worst films, but the potential of it being one of the best films was, was lost and who knows if Scarlett Johansson did a have a Robert Downey Jr. moment in bringing on this director, having to okay. say, having to say in, in, in this film that caused it not to be what it could have been. Your I read a that. quote mm -hmm. from Kate Shortland and I, I filed it away. I have it right here. I didn't tell you about it because I didn't want you to get worried. <laughs> So Deadline asked her a question, was this movie based on any specific comic book? Her answer, no. I worked with a Russian historian and we created the backstory. We went back maybe two years into Russia, into Soviet history and looked at what her life could have actually been like before she came to America. If that is not a red flag mm. for a comic book, how can you not read the comics of the character you're adapting i'm sorry yeah, yeah. And i saw that and i was like i understand you want to break the formula and do something standalone i'm actually not opposed to that and i will say this movie did a nice job of identifying itself at the beginning as being different because i believe you can check on this there's never been an mcu movie that had opening credits and this movie did mm -hmm. with a cover of smells like teen spirit or yeah, uh, and I, it immediately was like jarring. It was like this is not a Mar this is not the typical Marvel formula movie. And I think they were really trying to drive that home. But when I read that quote, I was like, uh oh, like mm -hmm. I don't want to be too far off the the origins of this character and some of the the storylines that she's been a part of. And you know, unfortunately, that that for me at least was the case. Now the other thing you brought, so you brought up an interesting point, which is. When I asked you what's the part you would watch, I was curious to see whether you were going to choose the action or, or the, or the non-action. And you, like me, you chose the non-action because the best parts of this movie are when it's the family, when the family is together, there's chemistry, any pair or the four of them together were well cast. So yeah. I give full marks to Kate Shortland and the cast and director um, for 
confusing Florence because so Florence Pugh did this movie before she did Little Women, which is what she was nominated for an Oscar for. So Correct. they identified her on the way up before she kind of hit it big. And I mean, David Harbour, like he's it's a ham performance, but he, it's great. I mean, he's mm-hmm. having fun and I like that. And Rachel Weiss is never bad, but the four of them together are very good. That no question is the best part of this movie. Um, and it it makes the non-action parts of the movie the most enjoyable. When I said I kind of, there was a point where I was like, I was getting a little bit bored. It actually was during some of the action. It was like, I knew the action was coming and I almost didn't want the family moment to end because I was actually enjoying that piece. Yeah. Of yeah. That, that, you know, that move that they have in the trailer with Florence Pugh uh, attack someone and she sort of sweeps him. It was towards the end. Yeah. You see it in the trailer all the time. It's like a helicopter spinning kick. Yeah. And the camera yeah. kind of rotates. And, and yeah. I was upset that that was the end of that sequence. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was the best single stunt in the movie. For, yeah. For fight. Well, it's yeah. a whole other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fighting wasn't at its best when it came down to the Taskmaster and Natasha Romanoff towards the end. Um, I would have liked to have seen more, more Florence Pugh fighting. We didn't get to see much of that on, on you know, only her fighting um, Natasha, which was a little bit jarring because it was a lot of shake. It was too much shaking. We really didn't get to see the actual martial arts. It was just too much camera movement for my taste. The best, so the best fight in this movie for my money is the one between Tasha and Yelena at the apartment. Yeah. And it, the only issue I have with it is it's, it actually reminded me a lot of the fight in the Bourne Ultimatum where Matt Damon's fighting yeah. that assassin like in yeah. the apartment in the bathroom. I thought the beats were pretty similar. Uh-huh. And the kind of thing is, you kind of know that they're going to end up being allies and friends, uh-huh. you know? So you're sort of watching it being like, okay, these are cool moves. They're really going hard at each other, but we know they're going to end up, you know, <laughs> yeah. chinking beer bottles in a couple minutes. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a little bit bummed, but that, I mean, that was definitely, for my money, the most fun sequence to watch the kind of two of them go at it. Yeah. But it did feed into something else I wanted to bring up. Were you okay with the physics of this movie? Because I it's, felt it, it's, like it kind of got fast, fury, fast and furious for me. Okay, because I felt like the previous movies, the Russo brothers in particular, were very skilled at making Natasha look very skilled as a fighter while not making it seem like she was an actual super soldier. So they would have like, remember like in Civil War, Crossbones blows out the building and Steve Rogers gets like pitched and he bounces off like two different levels and he hits the ground and you're like, Oh, and and he's in genuine pain. And you're like, yeah, but I buy that because we know he has the serum. I felt like Scarlett Johansson took bumps worse than that in this movie and walked away. And we know she's just a human being. Are you okay with how they kind of, it made her a lot, feel a lot more like an actual super powered superhero than I was actually comfortable with. Yeah, there were a few moments of that. I'm like, damn, that that, that seemed pretty. It, when the van gets like yeah, into the subway it, it, and she kind of walks out of it. Yeah, like, I mean, Nick Fury was, yeah, he's older, but he took a beating, you know, <laughs> and these guys just walk away from it. It, it definitely felt a little bit Fast 9-ish for me, uh, Fast and Furious for me. So that was a little bit like that That one, I, you know, I remember feeling like, mm, but okay, whatever, right? It's Marvel. <laughs> um... Again, it wasn't on par with what I expected or what I thought it would be, but it was an enjoyable film. It wasn't up there. It wasn't top shelf Marvel. Um, One of the things that I enjoyed the most was watching Taskmaster fight because you definitely saw some of the fighting techniques that other uh, Avengers use. Like, I'm pretty sure... he, he saw obviously he saw Captain America fight. He he saw Winter Soldier fight when he was using the knife. He saw a uh, Black Panther, uh, Black Widow. You, I, you definitely saw all those things. So that was cool to me to see that he was able to you know fight like that. But I agree with you from what you said previously that you know they really didn't get a chance to really take 
the opportunity to really explore um, that possibility of beating and how to beat him. They really missed that opportunity. I wish they would have done better with that. But again, this wasn't top shelf. So the other issue I wanted to bring up and get your thoughts on was scale. They went really big with this movie. The third act is, I mean, floating fortress in the sky. So my question to you is this. How, I guess I'm just having a tough time being like, are we supposed to believe that nobody else in the Avengers universe had any idea that any of this was going on? Because like this dude has agents all around the world. He literally has Watchtower from Justice League floating (laughs) above the clouds. She detonates the entire operation and and Thunderbolt Ross, we know, is there because we yeah. see him there. Did none of this gets back to the other Avengers ever? Like they're not aware that any of this happened. I would hope that oh, what you're saying is you're they're not aware that this was happening all along, or I'm just saying we know that this happens prior to Infinity War and Endgame. Correct. And yet we're made to kind of believe that this is happening in this enclosed space. She's dealing with it on her own. Mm-hmm. And it's like not having any broader impacts on the universe. And I, and I kind of feel like Florence Pugh actually brings up this point of like, at one point where she's like, yeah, isn't this is the point where they bring in the, the big Avengers to fix everything. Right. <laughs> to, yeah. Like this was such a big pro this was, and she, and her whole defense would be like, well, the Avengers are fractured post civil war. I can't ask anyone for help. I'm like, what are you talking about? You were, you picked a side. Like, yeah. Steve Ro- like you're going to help Steve Rogers right after this. Like these guys would have answered the call. And I'm kind of like, would, yeah, this was so big. It almost felt like it stretched believability that, Steve Rogers would have gotten a call. Yeah, it almost felt like you needed that help and they would have provided that help or there would have been broader ramifications. And I I think this movie would have been better served going a little bit smaller and tighter, but making the stakes really high and making the urgency such that she's like, hey, there's no time to ask anybody else. We, I got to fix this. We got to deal with this right now. And like, I don't know. It, it just... I hear what you're saying. That there were there was time to get recruit to to get help, but they didn't. It didn't seem reasonable for her not to ask for help, or that like the other Avengers are out there. Yeah. They wouldn't have detected that there was something going on, and like somebody wouldn't have come in in real life to been like, "Hey, you need a hand." Like, yeah, yeah. Again. I'm going to convince you on this because I'm just like, I'm going through my list. No, no, like, no, no. I, listen, I, I, that's I, what I mean I, by sloppy. To me, that's I, sloppy. Though. Yeah, yeah. I that's hear what sloppy you're writing. I that's hear what, what you're I'm saying. saying. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Again, this could be a Robert Downey John, a Robert Downey, Robert Downey Jr. That's his name, right? Um, a moment where they're writing this stuff and, and, they don't want to cause any friction. I don't know. I see what you're saying. I see this. I see some of that, that, that thinking of this could have been a little bit more tighter and more believable. It definitely felt to me more like a standalone film. Oh yeah. Um, but that's where, again, I go back to, it was too big to be a standalone film yeah. almost in this universe, but yeah. that clearly was the intent. Yeah. So I'll just, before we get into some of the things we, I do want to talk about some of the things we liked, especially Florence Pugh, but let me throw this at you as just like a premise because working with some of what they had. So as I said, I would shrink the scale Mm -hmm. 
we haven't talked about Rykoff, which I don't think is a coincidence because he's a zero as a villain. They got Ray Winstone playing this dude who basically is straight out of James Bond. I mean, she's literally watching yeah. James Bond in the movie, by the yeah. way. It's like, yeah. if you need inspiration. But why get, so, so to me, it's like what I would change about him is don't have the, ma the worldwide army of widows already built and in place. That's too big a scale. What I would have done is have it be that he's secretly starting up the old ways. So he's got like the one red room of soldiers plus the taskmaster. Yeah. They find out Ready about it. Ready to deploy. They find out about it. Because remember like in, in, um, in Civil War, we get the bait and switch, but they think they're going after five winter soldiers, right? Not five million that have been hidden, five, okay? So I think here that a similar idea would have worked better, which is they find out that their old mentor is up to his old tricks. And now it's like they discover the Red Room and they're like, we don't have any time. If we don't stop this group from getting loose right now, there's going to be a global yeah. problem. Yeah. And that I think could have like increased the urgency. And the way I would have done it, honestly, the movie I was thinking of, and it's a weird analog, I know, is uh, the Bruce Lee movie, Game of Death his <laughs> final movie where he passed away. I would have had her and Yelena, some combination, going through the Red Room almost like level by level, like facing some of the widows, maybe trying to save them along the way. I think that's great. And then having the Taskmaster as kind of the boss at the end, waiting. Yeah, and you and beat think, yeah. him to get to Rykov. Because Rykov, Wade Winstone is not going to be able to fight, right? He's not going to be a fighter. So yeah, yeah. So I would have done it kind of like almost like a video game and had her basically showing off like, hey, she's going to go out. This is her last movie. Like, let her show off every bit of physical talent that she's given us for a decade. and But keep it tight, like keep it moving like that, as opposed to I'm going to detonate this space station and just create <laughs> like mass destruction, like all mm -hmm. over wherever they were floating. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That was like when I sat back and thought about, I don't know what you think about that as an alternative, but like that no, I mean, maybe it, felt it, like it a makes little sense. better showcase for her. Yeah, I wasn't, because when I saw the movie, I, I guess I didn't have enough time to really think about it because I was so, I had other stuff to do after I saw the film. I really didn't have a chance to sit down and think about what would I have done to make this film a little bit better. But all of the things that you do bring up makes a hell of a lot of sense in that yeah it, it was just too big for others not to be involved time there was too much time um in between for you not to make that call if you needed it um knowing what you were up against um and yeah i would have made it more believable in that things are that urgent that I need to do this now within the next day or two or whatever to resolve this and not have all these because when I saw that 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 screen when he was showing where all these black widows are are located it's like it was like cerebro yeah it was just like <laughs> it's like they're all over the place they've been doing this for a minute and nobody knows nothing nobody knows <laughs> what are we doing here like, and, and and then you, I mean, if, when you think about it, you, you, you see the beginning of it, he's all over the place. He's with Jimmy Carter. He's with Bill Clinton. It's not like yeah. nobody knows. Um, what kind of conversations is he having with these these important people that, you know, this is not out there for S.H.I.E.L.D. to know? Or why is it Nick Fury? I mean, I would have loved the Nick Fury appearance, right? Um, but again. So they were dry. Look. I get what Kate Shortland was going for, right? She is trying to bring in the real world message about abuse, human trafficking. It's a global problem, right? That because they start flashing the pictures over mm -hmm, that map, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. That's where like the real world message is kind of colliding with maybe what makes the most sense for this movie. So I understood the intent of it. I'm just arguing that to your, the, the realism based on everything else we know about the MCU, it's kind of undercutting the Avengers skills there and their and shield. And I mean, I mean, I guess shields already got its own issues, but just the, like you said, the idea that no, that all of this took place with nobody asking a question. Yeah. yeah, 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 just, yeah. I don't know. Oh, no, I hear you. I hear you. Let me ask you this. You, do you think after seeing this film, 
do you think we would have gotten and i'm and i'm interested to hear your your your, your thoughts on this or your answer to this do you think we would have gotten a better uh black widow movie if we have gotten it earlier let's say yes two or three years yeah yeah so had they done this chronologically after civil war but before infinity war it plays better I think there's no question. It does hurt a little bit. It doesn't bother me. That but do you think we would have gotten the same story, though? Game. What's that? Do you think we would have gotten the same storyline, though? Oh, that's a good question. I, 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 I'm, I guess I'm saying if you gave me the exact same movie, but you gave it to me in 2017 as opposed to 2021, I'm saying... I don't. I still think I would have had a lot of the same complaints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not having seen Infinity War and Endgame at that point, some of the flaws would have been less apparent. Mm -hmm. And the connectivity to when she first shows up in Infinity War with her sort of whitish hair with Steve and and um, Falcon would have made would have felt kind of cooler, I guess, like more connected. So I do think like it suffered a little bit from the prequel syndrome of trying to fit this movie into a timeline that we had already seen and it's funny like i don't know if you remember this i was trying to remember like marvel is good at the details so rykoff loki references rykoff's daughter yeah in avengers when he's yes. imprisoned in the helicarrier he, he yeah. mentions it so yes. they, they literally did bring it Back. through for better or for worse we got to see um, what actually happened yeah so they did do that. Um, although I got to ask you, how much do you think Olga Karolenko got paid for this? To show, to do a little makeup on her. So she, she's been a Bond girl. She was the female lead of Oblivion with Tom Cruise. And she's the taskmaster in this. And I'm like, maybe she's going to do other things as a taskmaster now that she's been revived. But like, I want to know how much she got paid to have no lines and to basically be out of the helmet for 30 seconds probably not I, I i don't think she probably got paid a grip i mean she um, wasn't doing the stunts yeah she was yeah, not yeah, doing yeah, the fights nah, that was I mean, not actually her <laughs> <laughs> not much i don't think she didn't put, yeah. so that's like one hour on set three hours in the makeup chair and probably got paid but see that, this but. is this is the thing how we got in a film like this a black widow film let's say after Civil War, or let's say even before, either of the two, I think we get a different movie. I think we possibly get even a better movie. I think because it's now and because of how things ended with Endgame, it almost felt like they felt like they needed to do this movie for Scarlett Johansson or with Scarlett Johansson. I think there was a lot of influence from her. And like you said before, you know, Scarlett Johansson may be a joy to work with. Uh, when if you ask Kevin Feige, that's why he's so interested in working with her uh, on future projects. Not as obviously not as uh, the Black Widow, but perhaps executive produce. That sort of worries me if that ever comes to pass, because I think. This could be a situation where she had a lot to say in this film and the parliament wasn't there to do their, uh, didn't have a lot of say to do what they've been doing. And it's like saying, no, I don't think we should do this. We should do, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it, it, who knows if this is the reason for, and this is something that we'll, we'll talk about um, uh, in, in one of our nerd gen reports uh, about Kevin not making these long-term deals with, with actors and talent uh, um, because you don't want any actor to have that sort of, I mean, sure you like working with them, but you don't want them to course correct without having to course correct when things are working the way they are working and because you don't want to sort of strain relationships you 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 sort of back down that's not a good position to be in um 
But hey, it works out with Loki, right? Tom Todd Hiddleston has a lot to say, I think, in the, in, in Loki, right? Mm-hmm. And it's worked out tremendously. So it, it, it's a very interesting dynamic. I, I don't know if it's something that needs to be fixed or whatever, but I, uh, these are sort of the things that you gotta tread lightly on because you you know you get you get Black Widow, and again, not to say that Black Widow was a bad film. It's definitely, again, I'm going to keep on saying it's not top shelf Marvel. Um, I think it has, it feels to me that RDJ sort of treatment. That's what I mean, it feels think, like to me. Yeah, I, mean, I think, there, look, I, in terms of things that I think the movie was effective in doing, I think it made Black Widow, it, it humanized Black Widow effectively. You got to see a more emotional side. I got you got to see her growth as a character in the sense of she was concerned constantly for the well-being of the other widows, not just the mission. Like remember, like at the remember, like the start of Winter Soldier when they're on the ship and she's kind of very kind of flippantly just downloading the data and she's like, "Well, you know, that's your like to Steve. She's like, well, it's your job to do all this good stuff. I'm just here, you know." You see the growth here where she's caring about other people not reliving her experience. And I think the movie did do a good job of growing her in that mm-hmm. direction. I, my, As you can probably tell, my main complaint is I feel like we lost touch with some of the great stuff that she already was doing, namely her fighting prowess and her acumen in sort of problem solving on the fly in these missions. That that I feel like we took we traded that yeah. for... The emotional development and i'm kind of like why why did we do that why didn't we just add the one alongside the other so uh and then i mean maybe there's a good chance to talk about the other thing this movie was highly effective at is is it sacrilege to say that i'm more excited about seeing florence Pugh as the black widow than i oh, ever no. was seeing scarlett That's... johansson as the black widow oh, no, because no. florence Pugh like walked into the room took the heisman like ran out and was like the next decade is mine. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Florence Pugh is the next Black Widow, and we are certainly looking forward to her appearances in Hawkeye and whatever. And if they decide to do another Black Widow, there's definitely a future there. Kevin knows it. The Parliament knows it, and I think because. Florence Pugh is so, and not to say that Scarlett Johansson isn't, but because Florence Pugh is in the position that she's in now where she's coming in fresh, she's coming here to do what MCU is asking her to do. We're going to get um, a movie or, or, or a product that is in line with what they think it should be done and not what other people think should happen with a character. But this so, character was written really well. Oh yeah, this character was so the hu- she's hilarious. Like yes. the humor in this is hilarious when she mimics the pose and drops down <laughs> and then kind of like shit. That, that was that, was, that so was the funniest. Funny. That was the funniest part. People were dying in the theater. That is so. But it, she does it so casually where you're yeah. like, it feels like that's something <laughs> she would actually do. And then I think the other thing too that was really powerful is like when they're at the table as a family and she's kind of being like, wait, the best part of my life was like, she, you kind of buy the emotion of like how much it's breaking her up inside to be told like, nah, we weren't really a family. This character had a real arc. And like I said, I think she benefits from the fact that some of the stuff that Scarlett Johansson went through in the writer's room over the last 10 years that she's talked about with this character was too sexualized and it was too objectified. Florence Pugh gets the benefit of Scarlett Johansson having waged those wars internally to get oh, the starting point now is much stronger. But she just leaps off the screen. I mean, I hate to say it, but even in the scenes where it was like Yelena and Natasha, Yelena was stealing the scene. Oh, yeah. And that's up against you're you're up against another like Academy Award nominated actress like yeah. Scarlett Johansson, a dramatic actress. She's in the top tier, and and Yelena was, I mean, right there. was kind of taking her off the screen at points, which yeah. was just I was blown away that I had high expectations, but I was blown away at how 
naturally charismatic and believable she was. And I just, that's the thing is like, if this was ultimately the legacy of this movie is that it was a backdoor pilot for the new Black Widow, that may be the one thing we take from this is that it launched the next great character. That's what, that's what, that's what I took from yeah. it as well, though, that I felt like we sort of went back and um, sort of settled some of the references of, past dialogue in, in in past films and we saw it in this film and some of the things that tra transpired in budapest and and the red on her ledger that that was that had her uh, i guess messed up in the head and we got to see all of that and then it set up the future uh, of the black widow which i'm very excited to see because obviously black widow you know is, is certainly a huge part of the mcu when it comes to this sort of uh spy thing and and she's she's right up there and and she, and black widow listen mcu can do whatever they want but black widow has relationships with daredevil you know with a lot of different not not a lot of different but you know with with um other characters and who knows if it's going to be her to, to to do those things and, and and take up the mantle and 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 be even i say better than what Scarlett Johansson was. That's a, that's, that's a huge possibility because we already liked her a lot in this one. And so I'm sure they're gonna keep it rolling in the next iterations of whatever she shows up. In, and most certainly we're gonna most, most likely see her in Hawkeye. Yeah, you can't, you can't understate this part of it because even as we moved into phase four, look at what we have on the board so far. It has really been expansions of supporting characters from the prior phases right so wandavision takes scarlet witch and vision and puts them front and center but we already saw them in a number of movies falcon and winter soldier obviously takes two characters we loved as supporting characters and puts them in the center this is the first brand new character who has basically i don't i mean I don't know if I quite want to go as far as Downey and Iron Man 1, where it's like the minute he hit the screen, you were like, whoa, like, wh where did this come from? And like, obviously, you carry that through. But it's, in my mind, it has that impact of like, we're looking for next gen, right? Is Simu Liu going to be able to do that for Shang-Chi? Is Richard Madden or Gemma Chan going to do that for Eternal? This, I would say, there's two. This is really the biggest splash we've seen of somebody totally new where we're like, okay, if you're going to put her in six, seven things, I'm there for it. And she's going to be a positive force in all those. I think the other one is actually Sofia DiMartino and Loki. I think the um, Enchantress actually has been, she's been great in that series. Mm -hmm. I think she's, so we've got two new characters on the board, but this was like an A plus. Yeah. Like, I cannot wait to see what she does with this role next. And please don't take away her accent because she, it's absolutely, oh, no. it's absolutely part of what makes the character fun, so the way she delivers yeah. the lines yeah. with the accent. So I don't hope, I really don't want them to do an Elizabeth Olsen on this <laughs> and, and then cut the accent because it's actually part of what makes it work. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and one of the things that stuck out to me that, and what made it so standalone-ish that other than um, Natasha Romanoff and uh, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt Ross, I don't recall seeing any other character in there that we've seen before. Right? True. There's a reference to the Winter Soldier program. We're not going to count Julia Louis Dreyfus because she was supposed to make her first appearance in this. Again, so we'll yeah. credit that as the debut. I think you're right. There's no other random supporting characters that popped up in here. Yeah. No Shield agents, nothing like that. Yeah. No, you're right. So, so, so th this was this was certainly a movie that, because of its newness in terms of faces and stuff like that, it definitely felt. Nah, I wouldn't say it was a separate film but it certainly felt more standalone-ish outside of the references that they made to other films but uh, it certainly felt new and again uh david harbour and and i don't know if we'll see more of him possibly who I knows i hope we do i i have to say like the other my other favorite moment in this movie 
is when he's doing the proud dad and he's telling her like all oh, these people you killed I'm like look you're an avenger you're the best assassin in the world and he's like a proud papa yeah, and i'm yeah, like yeah. we always see in this universe like the the heroes have all these dad issues right like howard stark and tony stark or thor and loki with with odin they're always having these like complicated relationships and like weirdly this was like the most Rah rah, dad that we parent that we've seen but he's talking about all these awful things that they did i thought it was awesome i thought yeah. it was one of my other favorite movies moments yeah. in the movie. again i'll say it again black widow uh although it had its faults um it was an enjoyable film it was a good film again certainly not top shelf um but it was certainly you know good to go out to the movie theaters to see this film. Um, I what sort of um, crowd showed up for your uh, theater experience? None. Um, so, but I, I think I mentioned in F nine there were fourteen people in the theater besides me. I actually counted them because there were so few. <laughs> in this one, there were twenty four, and it okay. was a giant theater. So again, there were only two people in my row, and uh, in the entire theater. So there wasn't really we didn't have that atmosphere. You know, there really wasn't much of a reaction because there were so few people. You could hear the chuckles, but like yeah. you just didn't hear that cheer or anything like that. So it, I think you're right. Like I said, I had this moment of like, I was caught up in just being in a theater and seeing this on the big screen and like enjoying that piece of it. And it really, it, it, it's kind of soured in part as I've moved farther away from it and just thought about the flaws. And I'm just like, I, you know, and I can't, I can't defend them. That's why I feel the way I do about the movie. Mm -hmm. um, but the experience, like when the when the logo hit and the theme, the Marvel theme hit, I was like fired. I was like fired up. I was like, it's awesome to be back. To Let me ask you a question. Again. Do you and, and and we'll talk about this uh, this show later? But you know how when the in the Disney Plus you can skip through the the intros and stuff like. That. Do you skip the Marvel? Uh, no right <laughs> never never it's like i a, never skip it it's like it's, when you go to a fine restaurant and they give you the little like palate cleanser at the start of the meal to yeah, like get yeah, you set I yeah yeah. yeah 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 it's like in the old days when you know one of the, in the old days when star wars they brought back the 20th century fox logo with that mm -hmm. music they used to play right before the star wars theme hit mm -hmm. they went hand in hand like i could never and eventually they took it away. Now they don't have that theme anymore. And it actually feels a little bit off. So no, yeah. I, I loved hearing that part. Let, I got to get your thoughts on the stinger though. What did you think about the stinger? What did you think about? We've known that Florence Pugh was contracted to be in the Hawkeye series. I think we now know what her role at least is going to start out being. What did you think of that? Um, I just thought, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, well, I'll say this. I am looking forward to seeing her again as Black Widow or whatever she's called in, in, in Hawkeye. I am interested in seeing them to fight because they will. But I'm also still, not that we were clear before, but my hopes of why the Hawkeye film uh, all the Hawkeye show is being done because we, as you recall, I, I had a sort of plot that I think works and I don't know what we, I, I still don't know what we're getting. I know we're going to see Florence Pugh, but I don't, I still don't know what we're getting because if you, if you've seen the show before and, and our show, I've stated that what makes sense to me as to why we should get a Hawkeye series is that, you know, he, he turned into Ronan and during that time, those five years, he was murdering people, right? He was, but he was murdering gangsters and, and mafia and all that other stuff. And, and remember the snap, they brought those, some of those people back. And when they come back to their organizations and find out what's going on, why is it, what happens to these guys is they're going to point to Ronan. They're going to point to Hawkeye. Somebody's going to know that it was him that did all this and they're going to come after him for retribution. That makes more sense to me as a Hawkeye series. With far as Pew in the mix, it just makes it a little bit more interesting 
but I still don't know what the storyline is going to be for this series. And so I'm, I'm, I'm still curious, but I think, and, and yet more excited to see Florence Pierre. Yeah. I, so this will be interesting because I, I feel like they can't have her be in too much of this series. Otherwise she will overshadow the handoff from Clint Barton to Kate Bishop which ultimately has to be the heart and soul of this series if it has any chance of working. It's also going to be a challenge because we know that she's being lied to. Yes. So this is another instance where, you know, it's it, like knowing what we know, and I'm, I'm a little unclear as to how Valentina knows everything that happened on exactly. Vormir, to be quite exactly. honest. That's exactly. a little, they got to explain that to me. Yeah. But we know that at the end of the day, she's, Yelena is going to find out she's been tricked and that Clint is not really responsible. He's not really a murderer. He's not really responsible for Black Widow's death. Yeah. Which then ultimately probably has to set up that show leaving as. Haley Steinfeld and Florence Pugh are now running mates, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. Kate Bishop and New Black Widow are setting up to be the New Black Widow and Hawkeye in the way that Jeremy Renner and ScarJo were for the past decade. That kind of mm -hmm. seems like how. So I think the challenge is going to be this is one where it seems like we kind of know the end point already again, and you got to mm -hmm. make the stakes high enough along the way without Florence Pugh actually being the lead of this series, which every scene she's going to be in, she's probably going to steal. So I saw this and I was like, it makes it exciting, but actually I think it's going to make it challenging for the writers of this show as well. Yeah, it, it definitely will overshadow. I think her appearance and because people are so, um, I guess excited over her performance and and her character moving forward. That people are going to be looking forward to seeing her in this this series. And I don't think I don't think she'll be around too much in that series. If they do, it'll be a huge mistake because it'll definitely because again. Think about this for a second. WandaVision, Doctor Strange was supposed to show up. They said no, because if he shows up, it'll overshadow her. Uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. If you'd have had old man Steve show up. Yeah. It would have been, it would have just, it would have been the high point of that, of that uh, show. And everything is, would have been, I think what we feel about it now would have been felt even we would have felt even, we would have been down even more on it. Now, if they bring in Florence Pugh, which they will, what effect, now we're going to probably see what effect this sort of uh, cameo or involvement of her character will have on the show and the main characters of the show. This would be the opportunity to see what effects uh, it causes. So the recent comparison I could probably throw in this would probably be Jason Statham in Furious 7, where he kind of, he's the villain, but he's not actually in the movie all that much. He kind of mm -hmm. just hijacks some of the action scenes and attacks the crew. Mm -hmm. That's a maybe about the right amount you probably want Florence Pugh in this series. I will offer... I mean, I don't know how far, like how far afield in the storytelling they want to go here, but if they want to be bold, have her kill him. Yikes. If you want to be bold and really set up a really interesting, like parallel future relationship show, have her not figure out that she was tricked until after she avenges her sister's death. Ooh. Hey. Just throwing it out there as an idea. Because, and the only reason I bring that up is because Renner, the way he's dealt with this character, this is his send off. And he strikes me as the kind of guy where if he was writing, would kind of be like, remember how, like, when Harrison Ford was in, agreed to come back to Star Wars, he's like, I'm only going to do it if you, you kill, kill me, me. Yeah. and you send me off, like, in a big way. Yeah, yeah. I could see Renner doing the same thing with his writers being like, listen, I'm doing this show. 
but I don't want to be around at the end of the show. Like, give me like a hero's death in this. And in that death, while he's dying, he reveals the truth to her. Or something. And then maybe that sets up Kate Bishop starts out hating Yelena and they ultimately have to find their own path to redemption, both of them over kind of multiple. I don't know. I'm just floating it as a way to create stakes and unpredictability in this story. Yeah. I wish we were in that room, man, talking to these guys like, hey. <laughs> I wish I'd been in the room for this movie because I think I could have saved a few of these yeah, for them. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't hate doing that. It's a hard job, and I don't want to ever take away from people for, you know, having to put these together. But this one, like I said, I just, I think they I think they left some on the table in this one. And I was just disappointed for for Scarlett Johansson's sake that that she didn't, that the send-off wasn't stronger for, for her. Um all right, so what's your overall star rating before we uh, kind of leave this? So, so far, the box office seems um, good for Black Widow. It seems like it will do much better than Fast and the Furious. They set a record, and I think Black Widow, when it's, once it's said it done for this weekend, will will outperform uh, Fast and the Furious. Um, but it may suffer due to uh, you. You sent me an article from Variety, which made a lot of sense, man. What makes it difficult to for for the box office to do, let's say, even five hundred thousand? Based on what I read, it's like it's gonna be hard for for them to to get to that point if this is the case, right? With regards to China and two uh, variables that may hinder the, 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 the box office potential of this film. One being piracy. You're not, because it's on Disney Plus, you're getting like 4K. I don't know the thing, I don't know how they do this stuff where they get it out there, but you have great copies. The piracy is like, you're not getting people, you're not getting a, a, a pirated uh, film on a DVD or whatever the case may be, or on, even on torrents, where you got people walking across the screen or you, it, it, you're getting good stuff, right? So that's one problem. So it's, again, that's, that's one number that is gonna be interesting to hear from Disney when uh, when they re- release it. Right, and, the, and the issue is the, China box office has delayed the opening of this movie, so they're not synced up with the global release the way they used to be. So the issue of piracy is that this movie can, and Disney Plus is not an option for Chinese exactly. consumers. So I, they can watch this movie, the pirated version, long before it ever comes out in the movies and how much bo- global box will that cost this film in the long run? That's sort of the, the question that has arisen here in the last few days. Yes. And also the other variable is the political uh, uh, reason. Mm -hmm. Um, They have some sort of, uh, they have some sort of celebration or some sort of acknowledgement of of, of something that's, they're doing a lot of propaganda or, or showing a lot of different other films or local films uh, that uh, for July, um, and they were saying that it might even go up to fall, where they may not release Black Widow um, in the theaters because of it. Uh, I'll put the link in the description for that uh, that um, article so that you guys can check it out. But it really it highlights specifically those two reasons why that may hurt the potential of the box office for Black Widow, and it looks it looks pretty grim for them to reach big numbers. But for this weekend, Black Widow is going to do just fine. And it's going to probably be, you know, it's going to probably break records, whatever. We'll see what um, when Monday comes, what numbers they reach. Yeah, they, they did really well. So I didn't want to, so to give you some perspective, like F9 crossed 500 million of global um, this week and they don't have the same, um, China restriction that that Black Widow's suffering, but I think when all said and done, Black Widow will do better than that. But the opening weekend, I think, is eye-openingly good. So the projections I've seen are kind of eighty-five to ninety million, based upon what the Thursday Friday numbers were. I think they'll probably wind up a little bit better than that. Disney tends to be pretty conservative if you look mm-hmm. at their history about what Sunday tends to be. 
but I, I kind of went back and I tried to put some numbers around how much is the Disney plus affecting this. And what I think is interesting is if you look at the Thursday night, the pre-shows, they did 13.2 million on Thursday night. That was higher than Spider-Man Homecoming, higher than Doc Strange, a little bit lower than Ragnarok. And why that's significant is Doc Strange did 85 million its opening weekend. Spider-Man did 117, Ragnarok did 123. So it looks like this movie is going to wind up being about 90, call it, uh -huh. with a similar start. So normally movies follow a similar path. The uh -huh. difference obviously is none of those other movies had a Disney Plus option. So what I tried to say was, okay, let's say it's 90 million is what they get from the box office. And by the way, not every theater is at 100% capacity, but 90 uh -huh. million. Then let's assume that they were tracking pretty close to the Spider-Man Homecoming Ragnarok level, which would have implied like a $120 million opening weekend. Yeah. So that's about a $30 million difference. So very simplistically, 30 million bucks divided by 30 bucks on Disney Plus is 1 million customers. Is it realistic that 1 million families and households bought this movie over the opening weekend? I think that's a pretty low number. I think it's very realistic that at least a million of the 100 million subscribers they have bought this movie in the opening weekend. Yeah. So that tells me if you add that together, this was a really big open. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if Disney pocketed closer to like, well, their cut of the 90, let's call mm -hmm. it 50, mm -hmm. and then clipped another 60 to 75 just off the $30 payment rate. I, I don't believe it was just a million people that bought it. 1% of their customer base bought yeah, this yeah, movie yeah, opening yeah, weekend. Yeah. I think it was higher than that. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to point that out to people when you look at this number and you try to back into what would this number have been pre pandemic with no Disney plus my criticisms aside, the cinema score was a minus 92% of audiences on Rotten Tomatoes like this movie. They would have put up a big, opening weekend number and i don't yeah. see enough people like highlighting that but i just wanted to point that out to people that like this was a big open i'm quite certain that more than a million people bought this if you think about except i was expecting to see a lot more people in the theaters and i didn't which tells me like if there was no pandemic the theaters would have been packed i probably wouldn't have been able to buy a ticket that weekend i think you're right about that Neither would have, um, I would have had to buy mine a lot earlier and it would yeah, have been full. Yeah. yeah. And having said that, it's, I'm quite certain that more than a million people bought, paid $30 per household to watch um, Black Widow. And if that is the case, remember, they keep all of that. All of it. It's, it's going to be very interesting to see what those numbers are because that's a hell of a take man because what people oh it made a billion dollars the movie made a billion dollars but they don't keep a billion dollars imagine you know let's say five million if five million people bought this at thirty dollars a pop that's what 150 150 million bucks they keep all of that with no no cost to them right there's like there's the marketing upfronts but once you buy the movie there's no it's not like they're paying anybody to take your ticket or sell you concessions it's Thanks. all revenue to them so i don't know what to tell you my friends things are going to be very interesting to see when those numbers come out and how things uh moving forward go yeah, I just wanted to point that out because I see the articles are written from the standpoint of like, this is an encouraging sign post pandemic. And I'm trying to tell you, this is a big open. Yeah. Like, this is in the elite class. If we, to your point, if we think it's 3%, 4% of the subscriber base paid for this opening weekend, yeah, you're talking about a weekend that's much closer to like an Avengers movie than yeah. a standalone movie. Yeah. Yeah, um, that is our, oh, what is my rating? Out of five stars. Sure. 
I would give this a two and a half. Oh, I don't think you're gonna go higher than that. Nah, two and a half. <laughs> two and a half is good. It, okay. Cause two and a half is not bad, you know. Okay. Cause there's people that didn't like it, and there's people that 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 did like it. I'm one of those people that did like it. Okay. You know, but I, again, it's not top show. It's not top show. But it, it was definitely enjoyable. I'd watch it again, and I'll watch certain parts again going forward. But other okay. than that, it's no Winter Soldier, no Infinity War, no Endgame. It's not that. Uh, well, if you're going two and a half, then I'm at one and a half. I mean, there's just it's God a full, damn, I'm a full <laughs> yeah. I'm like I'm a full turn below you for sure. I think, and I think of that one and a half. Florence Pugh herself is probably taking it from a one to a one and a half. So, um, yeah, I, I just I, I, I feel underwhelmed and I feel a little bit disappointed, um, you know, from some of the key things that I've loved about Black Widow through the years. But I will say, new Black Widow. I mean, sky's the limit. So, oh know, yeah, oh, I, I hope I. We'll talk about the contracts. I hope he's got her on like a six, seven <laughs> picture deal because she's gonna be expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is our review for the Black Widow. I hope you guys check that out. Please let us know in the comments what you thought about this film, what you thought was good about the film, what you thought was bad about the film. Out of five stars, what do you give this movie? Um, and let us know what you would have done differently for this film if you didn't enjoy it. Um, or did, if you thought this movie was uh, not on par with um, your expectations of what you would have done differently. Let us know in the comment section below. Please also hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Share with your friends. Um, it really does help support the channel. And we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Review Show. We'll see you next time. Bye.